It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. That is, if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things that we note. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. I got a question about the translations that uh, I use here. Uh, what I've been using today is NIV, uh, but uh, usually what uh, we do here is go straight from the Greek. And that's because the Apostle Paul did not speak English. And uh, David, he spoke Hebrew, and Moses spoke Hebrew. Uh, no one in the Bible, that, and at the time when the Bible was written, spoke English. There was no English language. Now the King James Version is a version that the King of England signed himself. Now the King of England was no scholar in the Greek language. King of England was no scholar in the Hebrew language, but he signed off on it, and the only way that uh, they were going to have a Bible in England is if the king did sign off on it, and that's when politics and church mixed. It's a bad mixture. And so uh, some of the things that come out of the King James Version are, why is it called King James? King James authorized it. Uh, many people think God authorized it. No, King James did. God authorized Greek. Here's a Greek Bible. If you want to look at it yourself after class and get a kick out of it, then uh, here's Greek. I'm all tied up, so I can't run around like a Pentecostal. <laughs> but there's a, uh, a Greek Bible. If I ran around, I might get more attention, but that's not what I'm here for. So what we're studying now is our country and how we are really in trouble as a nation, how we've fallen apart at the most basic uh, trends of history, such as marriage, 50 to 60 percent divorce rate. That's an indication of a nation falling apart. Uh, all sorts of things, people just living together, etc. It's a big mess. And our country's in a big mess. And uh, the only way we're going to get straightened out is if some people get back to what the Word of God has to say. And uh, stop going on emotion. Don't go by how you feel. You know how many people go by how they feel about everybody. I feel this way, so this is the way it must be. That's arrogance. You think of yourself so highly that how you feel is paramount. How you feel is not paramount. It's what God thinks. And what does God think? It's right here. And you have to dig into it and interpret it and learn it. And the only way to do that is from the gift of pastor teacher. If you could learn it on your own, you would be at home right now reading it on your own and learning it on your own and reading your own little commentaries and trying to get it on your own. If you think you can get it that way, have fun. You'll be spinning your wheels. God ordained certain spiritual gifts, such as gift of pastor teacher. God ordained spiritual gift of help so people can go to hospitals and help people and encourage them. God ordained certain uh, gifts of administration so that they can help with the production of MP3s and uh, etc. Uh, God gave people uh, other gifts so that they can handle the treasury, etc. And we all have different gifts and one's not higher than the other. And even though the pastor teacher is a visible gift and does have authority, it's not higher than the gift of helps. How can the hand say to the foot, I don't need you? That's what it says in Corinthians. But today there's so much competition in churches among people and they gossip and they malign and they judge and they talk about things they don't even know what they're talking about. And they gossip about people they don't even know what they're saying. I just heard a moment ago that somebody thinks that we don't teach there's a hell. Yes, we do. There's a hell. If you don't believe in Christ, you're going there. Straight to hell. I believe that. But see, people say things they don't know. 
and they gossip and they malign and they judge and they rip apart. Why? Well, it's part of the old sin nature. I almost sounded Pentecostal. <laughs> so a client nation is what we are. And we are under the patronage of God. And as a result of us being what is called a client nation, a nation separated unto God, we've been assigned certain responsibilities. In the formation, well not the formation, but in the preservation, communication, and the dissemination of the scripture. Now Israel was the first client nation and they had the formation of the scripture. They formed the Torah. Moses wrote the Torah and before Israel became a client nation the custodianship of the word of God involved divine revelation apart from scripture you know in the Old Testament uh, Jesus Christ would come down in the form of what they would say an angel and would uh, talk to people like Abraham doesn't happen today if you've seen Jesus Christ you're loony you haven't seen him even though we haven't seen him we love him that's what the Bible says for us today but in the other dispensation, Jesus Christ did come down and take angelic form to communicate things that were not yet written. Most people in the Old Testament couldn't even read anyway. So during the formation of the uh, Old Testament, this is when uh, the client nation, the first client nation, come onto the scene, and that was Israel. Israel was the first client nation. That is, they were set apart unto God. But today we're something different. Today we are a royal priesthood set apart unto God. Uh, look, turn in your Bible to 1 Peter 2.9. 1 Peter 2.9. I only laugh because that root beer looked like beer. <laughs> Zach's over there chugging beer while I'm teaching. 1 Peter 2.9. 1 Peter 2.9. You're probably more lucid than others anyway. First Peter 2 9. But you are an elect race, a royal priesthood. Who? Us. Those who believed in Christ. But you are an elect race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out from the darkness into His marvelous light. That's not King James. That comes straight from the Greek. And there it is. If you know how to read it, translate it yourself. So the idea of an elect race actually comes from 2 Corinthians 5.17. And this is a verse that many people confuse. And let's take a look at it. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Now what we have here is something referring to actually a new spiritual species. And this is how it goes, translated directly from the Greek, and I'll even give you some Greek words. Therefore, if anyone is in union with Christ, he is a new spiritual species. Old things have lost their power. Behold, new things have come to pass. And you say, well, my Bible doesn't say new spiritual species. Where do you get that? I'll tell you where I get it from. The Apostle Paul and his Greek language. And this is what it really comes out as. Kine katesis. Kine katesis, translated from the Greek, means new spiritual species. And we are. We're born again. And when you're born again, you're born as a new spiritual species. So again, therefore, if anyone is in union with Christ, how do you become in union with Christ? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. At the moment you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Holy Spirit baptizes you and puts you into union with Christ. That's why we can say in Christ. That's why people sign their letters in Christ, so and so. Why? Because you're in Christ, because you believe in Christ. Not because you've worked not because you've even changed your lifestyle. 
but because you believed in Christ. And you say, but this verse indicates I should change my lifestyle. No, it doesn't. Therefore, if anyone is in union with Christ, he is a new spiritual species. Old things have lost their power. What old things? Bar hopping, smoking, drinking, dancing. Are those the old things? No. What are the old things? The old things are you trying to work your way into heaven. Those things have lost their power. You've tried to get into heaven your whole life by what you do and who you are and what you say. And uh, you do this all the time, gossiping, maligning, and judging, and not even knowing that those are sins. Those are the seven worst sins, which are an abomination, as we studied in Proverbs. When you gossip, you're committing one of the worst sins ever. When you malign someone and rip them apart to make yourself feel better or to build your own ego, you're destroying yourself. You're not destroying someone else. If you build your happiness on someone else's unhappiness, Maybe you don't like somebody, so you're going to make them feel miserable. And when you make them feel miserable, you say to yourself, All right, I got him this time. Now he really feels bad. He must feel bad. He's probably not even thinking about you. But you're trying to build your happiness on someone else's unhappiness. And those are old things, by the way. And these old things have gone away. And that means you've always tried to work for your salvation, but that's gone now. That's lost its power. You've been saved by faith alone in Christ alone. You are now kane katesis, a new spiritual species. And as a new spiritual species, you've been given a wonderful spiritual life that you can live. But you've got to start to understand it. And the reason why this country is in trouble is because so few people have cared to come to understand the unique spiritual life. They have gone in for religion. Oh, you say, well, I go to this church and uh, they teach this and that. And they may even teach you're saved if you believe in Christ, and that's wonderful. Glad you've been saved. But uh, now what? Have you ever asked yourself after you're saved, now what? You see, this is the most puzzling thing that I think that I, The most puzzling thing I ever think about is how come people who have believed in Christ don't ask themselves... Now what do I do? Yes, I believe in Christ. Yes, I'm saved. Yes, I'm heaven bound. I'm glory bound. Amen. Yes, but now what? Nobody seems to ask that question. And if you ask that question, you always want to follow through. And you usually you go up to a pastor and say, All right, I believe. Now what? What does he say? Yield, brother. Yield, brother, yield. What's that mean? I don't know. If you do know, then uh, I feel sorry for you because it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> yield, brother, yield. It's not in the Bible. Oh, well, in King James it says yield, I know. But what's that mean? What does it mean? It means some type of emotional feeling. It means something that you feel deep down in your heart. God's not impressed. God is impressed with His Word. He's not impressed with how you feel, and it's something that a lot of people have a hard time ever understanding. And that's why our country's in trouble. They put on a pedestal their emotions. That's why the Bible says, you've made your emotions out to be your God. How you feel is ultimate. No, it's not. It's not how you feel. It's not even what you feel about anything. It's about what does the Word of God have to say. And so how do you? I'll tell you how you live your spiritual life. First of all, you've got to understand the most basic of doctrines. 1 John 1 9. Turn in your Bibles to 1 John 1 9. You can yield all day long, and you'll just you'll be doing that, going slow. That's about it. Because you are slow, yielding. What does that mean? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Not compared to this unique spiritual life. Whatever you think yielding is, it's nothing. First uh, John 1 9. I'll give you the King James Version as much as I can remember it. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I guess that's about as close as I can get to the 
That's it. But from the Greek, it says, if we name homologeo, homologeo means to name. It's 5th century B.C., Athens, Greece word, and it's technical. And when the Bible says something, it means something, and so we have to get technical with it and look up what Paul was saying. Paul did not speak English. Actually, John in this case. John did not speak English. He spoke Greek. And he said, homologeo. If we name, if we name, it's like in a courtroom. Is that thunder or a truck? If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us, katharizo. Now this is how John would say it. Katharizo, purify us from all wrongdoing, adakia. All that is Greek language. And that's actually how it comes out. And it's a far greater translation than what King James would have you read. King James didn't know any better, bless his heart. He just didn't. He was just a king, a political figure, who anointed a Bible in which he should have had no hands on that Bible whatsoever. No political figure should be determining what a Bible has to say, ever. But that's what he did. And he authorized it. That's why it says... King James authorized version. King James is the one that authorized it. It does not say God the Father authorized version, does it? No. None of them are really from God the Father. These are English translations. The only one that is pure in every way is the Greek. And if you want to look at the Greek, there it is. And the Hebrew in the Old Testament. Also Aramaic, which is what our Lord Jesus Christ spoke. So 1 John 1 9. If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. That's the only way you're ever going to be in fellowship with God, naming your sins to him. And why? When you name your sins to God, it's your first act of humility. You see, when you believe in Christ, the first thing that happens, or one of the things that happens, all your sins are wiped out. All of your pre-salvation sins are blotted out. Whatever you did as an unbeliever, no matter how much hell you raised, no matter how much trouble you caused anyone, all that's blotted out. Jesus Christ has forgiven you. Why? Because you believed in Him. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved. All pre-salvation sins are forgiven. But after you're saved, you carry with you in the member of your own body something called the old sin nature, called sarks in the Greek, flesh. And you carry the old sin nature in your body. That's why the Apostle Paul said in Romans, I do what I do, but I don't want to do it, but I do it anyway, and I don't understand it. And why doesn't he? Because he has an old sin nature. And this is the Apostle Paul, saved, of course, the greatest believer ever, the Apostle Paul, and he sinned and made mention of it. Now let's look at 1 John 1 8 and 1 John 1 10. 1 John 1 8, I'll read from the NIV this time. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. Now, is this talking to people who aren't saved? No. First John was written to believers, people who have already believed. And how do I know that? 1-1. One, one. That which was from the beginning, which was not the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our very own eyes, which we have looked at. Who's we? Believers. They've seen it. Which we have looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was from the Father and has appeared to us. Who's he talking to? People who have already been saved. People who have already believed in Christ. First John's not written to unbelievers. It's talking about us and we and all of us who have understood the word of life. All of us who have believed. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These are believers. We write this to make our joy complete. Only way you can have complete joy is to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. First John was written to those who have already made the greatest decision ever to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the message we have heard 
from him and declare to you, God is light, in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. Fellowship. Now what's he talking about in verse 6? Fellowship with God. He's not talking about salvation. He's talking about you as a believer dining with God in fellowship. And how do you do it? Well, 1 John 1, 9 is the answer and the ultimate solution for that. But again, let's look at 1, 8. And this is the uh, fact that this is not for unbelievers. Unbelievers shouldn't be running around confessing sins. Unbelievers should be believing in Christ. 1 John 1, 8. If we claim to be without sin, we who? Believers. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If you say you're not a sinner, the truth isn't in you. You don't understand one thimble full of the Word of God. If you think you walk around sinless, you have the biggest chip on your shoulder I've ever seen. I sin, you sin. You might not want to know what my sins are, but they're none of your business and your sins aren't mine. They're God's business, and that's why we name it to God. That's why David said, Against God and God only have I sinned, even though he murdered Uriah the Hittite and committed adultery with Bathsheba. And, and David, by the way, was a man after God's own heart, and he committed both adultery and murder. Now, I'm not encouraging you to do the same. He was punished severely for it. He lived out the days of his life under punishment installment discipline it became a blessing for him because he got straightened out he named his sins to God that's all found in the Psalms so if we claim to be without sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us now let's look at 1 John 1.10 again it repeats if we claim we have not sinned we make him out to be a liar that's God and his word has no place in our lives. Somebody comes up to me and says, I'm not a sinner anymore. They're a liar and the word of God has no place in their lives. Many people say, well, I believe in Christ. My sins have been washed away forever. Your pre-salvations have been washed away forever. And you are saved, but you're still going to sin, buddy and lady. All of you ladies and gentlemen, all of us sin and if you think to yourself you can become sinless, you don't understand the Bible. You don't understand 1 John 1, 8 and 1, 10. You don't understand that you're making God out to be a liar and you don't even understand you're deceiving yourself. Now again, I tell you, it's not an excuse to sin. None of us have an excuse to sin. I know what people think. You teaching this, you know, I might agree with it, but you teaching this, it's going to make the young people run out and sin. No, it's not. How in the world is teaching the Bible going to make somebody sin? If you think that way, you're ignorant. We don't encourage sin here. Never have, never will. We encourage living the spiritual life. And what I encourage is 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all wrongdoing. Name it. Actually, name it and disregard it. There's a sin up there called Rebound and Keep Moving. Not a sin. A book up there. A book up there called Rebound and Keep Moving. And that talks about all of these things that I'm telling you now. So that you can get started in your spiritual life. And that's just the beginning. This is the beginning of the answer. Now what? You might have lived your whole life wondering, now what? And you've heard a whole bunch of different stuff from a whole bunch of different people. And they've told you a lot of platitudes and they've given you a lot of epigrams. But has it gotten you anywhere? Do you really know what you're doing in this spiritual life which you've been given? Do you know you've been given 39 irrevocable absolutes plus one, the filling of the Spirit? Do you know how to be filled with the Spirit? Do you know what it says in Ephesians chapter 4.30 to stop grieving the Spirit? What's that mean? What does it mean? Have you ever thought about it? What's it mean to stop or do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God which is in you? What's that mean? Do you know? 
If you don't know, you haven't been under a good teacher. What do these things mean? And the, the problem is, when you start to learn the Word of God, something's going to hurt. Something's going to step on your toes. It steps on mine all the time. I read verses and study the Word and I see stuff where I failed in my life and it makes me want to grit my teeth. I say, man, that is the way I am and I don't like what I see. See, I look in the mirror of the Word of God and say, that is ugly. I am one ugly SOB. And we all are. Ooh, that's shocking. It's not as shocking as what God thinks of us. That's how God thinks. All of us are depraved, by the way. And that's what we all are, basically. And so we grow in grace and in knowledge, and that is how we come to understand what to do in the Word of God. Now, as I said, the Word of God will step on people's toes. And uh, for some reason, the only verse I can think of to give you an example of stepping on toes, you see, I, some people think I'm harsh on the women. You might be right. First Peter chapter 3. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. Now, I only do this because I know it hurts the women. and I. But I'm just trying to make a point that uh, the Word of God hurts. And 1 Peter chapter 3 hurts. 1 Peter chapter 3. Now the men can sit on their hands while the women vibrate, but this is the Bible. And it does hurt. And when you see things in the Bible, when you know you haven't followed it, and we all have messed up in some way at some point, it's going to hurt us. And you say, why do you even bother with such a little church? Why do you even bother teaching all these uh, few people? Why bother? Well, because well, there's, they, they want to learn something, and the reason why I bother is because those of you who are just visiting, you don't know how tough I am. Unless somebody's gossiped, you may know. But you really don't know how tough I can be. And I'm tough on them sometimes. Sometimes I go home feeling bad I've been so tough. And uh, But it's something I have to do in order to show them what the Bible says. Now... Most pastors know they have to be tough, but they'll never be tough because they don't want to lose a congregation. I don't care about that. only thing I care about is teaching what the Word of God has to say. And if you don't like it, I don't care. And people can't get over that because they want to run over a pastor. They want a sweet, smiley man they can run over. I'll tell you something about Jesus Christ when he was throwing out money changers. That was not sweet. You don't mess with people's money. Could you imagine, here you are, money changing, and here comes Jesus Christ, and he's just, with all of his strength, just picking up all of this money off these tables and throwing the table, and the money just goes everywhere, and it gets all mixed up, and nobody even understands whose money is whose. Don't you think they hated him for it? You better believe it, they hung him on a cross. It's not all fun and games. It's not all sweetness and light. And people have the weird idea that a pastor teacher should be sweet and kind and all of those things. Well, I'll tell you something. A pastor teacher should be very compassionate. And sometimes that compassion is showed in tough love. It's showed in because, because when the Word of God speaks, all human discussion should cease. When the Word of God says something, shouldn't we agree with it? Yes. If we don't, should we make a big deal out of it? No. If you do, leave. If you don't like what a pastor says, don't come back. That's what I've never understood. People get in fights and squabbles in churches and they don't even... They don't leave. They just want to stay there for the fight, I guess. See what's going on. What kind of gossip can we come up with this Sunday? Yeah, they don't go every day. Just, what's the this Sunday not to God crowd I call them? Hey God, I see you this weekend. I acknowledge you. Next Sunday, there you are, God. I acknowledge you. What about the other five days of the week? Where's God in your life? Ask yourself that. So this really tends to uh, step on women's toes anyway. 1 Peter 3. Wives, in the same way be submissive to your husbands. 
I think even the King James says that. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands so that if any one of them do not believe the word, that they be won over without words. Have you ever really read that and thought about it and chewed over it? Ladies, Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, that means maybe they don't believe the word. Maybe they don't follow in your self-righteous footsteps. Maybe you run around to the women's club and talk about how many beers he drinks every evening. And you run him down, run him into the ground. But guess what this says? Without a word. It means keep your mouth shut, ladies. I didn't write it. I didn't write it. I couldn't write this. I'm not smart enough. God wrote it. Wives. Well, God wrote it through Peter. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words. That means stop nagging. Do not nag. It won't get you anywhere anyway. Nagging a man half to death, he just, he'll, he'll just it's like he has a hearing aid and turns it right off. Yeah, I'm watching my football game. I'm not listening to you. Shut up, you old hag. <laughs> Turn it right off. So how do you win the man over? Maybe you are a wonderful woman. Maybe you do love the Word of God. How do you win over a man who doesn't care for the Word of God? Without a word. Without nagging. You see, it does hurt, doesn't it? And you're going to go home being mad at me, but I'm just reading. You're, you're uh, attacking the mailman, the messenger. You'll go home and attack the messenger. Well, that's insane. This is the message. You attack me, you might as well attack the message. You might as well rip out this part of your Bible. By the behavior of their wives, when they see the purity and reverence of your lives, your beauty should not come merely from outward adornment. There's nothing wrong with wearing makeup. There's nothing wrong with wearing earrings. I hope all of you ladies wear makeup and get pretty. We don't like ugly people in our church. <laughs> Dress yourselves up. That was a joke. Don't get all too stiff on me. None of you are ugly, by the way. So when they see the purity and reverence of your lives, your beauty should not come from outward adornment. That is not merely from outward adornment such as braided hair and wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self. What is your inner self, ladies? Is it nag, 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 wine, 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 do this, do this, do that, honey-do list? You think the man was designed for a honey-do list? No. He's the one in authority, whether you like it or not. That's the way God designed it. I didn't. Shoot, it would be easier for me to be in obedience because it's easy for me to be in obedience. It doesn't bother me to obey people. And if the Bible said obey your wife, that'd be the easiest thing in the world to do. I'd be running around like a chicken with my head cut off, but it'd be easy. And so would all you other men. After a while, you got to understand, God has set up this system, and I didn't. And it is a beautiful system, not just because I'm a man, but because God set it up. You'd think I was a teenager going through some type of uh, voice change. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braiding hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self. The unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. That don't mean you can't talk. It just means you can't nag. You can talk all you want. I love conversation with ladies. Ladies are the best conversation makers in the world. Don't look at me mean. I'm not. Uh, I'm not flirting with them. I'm just. I just like conversation with them. They're fun to conversate with. So, <laughs> instead, it should be of the inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. So, what do you do after salvation? You got to start learning the word. It's not how you feel. It's not what you feel you should do. It's what the Word of God says. And sometimes the Word of God says stuff we don't like. And sometimes it steps all over our toes. So what? 
we got to get over ourselves. And we got to come to a point of humility where we say, you know what, that guy, he really gets on my nerves, but he's saying something that's from the Word. At least he's teaching the Word. At least he's not giving me a line. And most people like their ears tickled. They have itching ears, and they want their ears tickled by a pastor. And they want the pastor to pat them on the back and tell them how good they're doing. That's not my job. Your life is none of my business. It is my business to teach you the Word of God, and that's what I do. And you say, why do you do it daily? That sounds crazy. I do it daily because that's the way the Word of God has set it out. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ came in the garden daily to teach Adam and Eve, and they still didn't learn anything. They still fell all apart in their marriage. And uh, people always wonder. It sounds kind of weird. That's kind of cultish every day. Look, I don't make these people show up every day. They do it on their own free will. I don't make anybody show up. Sometimes I show up, it's just me and my family. Sometimes it's just me and I'll go home. You see, it's not, it's not about that. It's about a job that I know I have to do. Look, don't you eat every day? Don't you take in normal food every day? Why not spiritual food? Has anybody ever thought about that? You see, you just most people just go on in life and they don't know what their spiritual life is and they just don't seem to care. It's like, so what? I'll go to church on Sunday, dedicate my life to the Lord again, and everything will be fine. No, it won't. Why did, why did God give us this? Why did God give us this, all of this to learn and understand? Did He give it to us just so we could glance at it on Sunday for 20 minutes and have a song service for 30 minutes? Absolutely not. He gave this to us so we could learn it and have happiness. This is where happiness is. This is the key to happiness. And uh, you may not believe that, and that's fine. This is not a cult. And whether you show up or not is none of my business. And I don't care if you show up or not. And that's the truth. Oh, I care in that I wish people would learn the word, but if you don't care about it, then it's how can I change it? What am I going to be, like the nagging wife trying to change you all the time? Absolutely not. That's just the way it is. And if I cared about audience... You know, if I cared about audience, the one thing I would do, I, for, the first thing I would do was stop teaching Monday through Friday. Forget that. If I wanted a big audience, forget Monday through Friday. Nobody shows up then, unless they're serious, and people do. But I would say, Matt, forget Monday through Friday. On Sunday, this is what I'll do. We're going to rise up. Hallelujah. We're going to rise up. Amen. We're going to go for Jesus. Amen. Why even talk like that? What is there, some holy language? Did the Bible say, okay, pastors, this is the what you should do. At the end of every sentence, put a uh on it. I'm going to rise up, up, uh. Amen. <laughs> they act like they're having seizures sometimes. You wonder, what are you doing? You see, some of you don't like this because you've never heard it before, but the stuff that's going on in this country is sickening. Have you ever thought to yourself, why do they do it that way? To entertain, to get people riled up emotionally. Is God impressed because you can rise up? Is God impressed because you can stand on the two feet that he gave you? No! God is impressed with what you know. And this country is going under, and as it says in Hosea, the reason why this country is going under is because they lack knowledge. Not because they sin, because they lack knowledge. Knowledge of what? This! The Bible! And they get all emotional, and they run up and down aisles, and they act like fruit cakes. Nutty people. Is that Christianity? Oh! Is, that, is God impressed because you can raise your hand toward heaven? He is not. You say, but I'm praising him. How do you praise God? With what you know, not with your physical flesh. Not because you can run around, and not because you can scream and shout and all the other stupid stuff people do. It's insanity. And that is not Christianity. Just 
watch uh, Channel 6, you probably have. Most of the stuff is ridiculous. You say, but I like that channel. Well, you better keep on watching it because you don't belong here. <laughs> Definitely not. You'll be running out of here gossiping every minute you can. Well, that man's psychotic. That man, he's going against the grain. You better believe I'm going against the grain because we're in a time in this country of apostasy. And as we come to celebrate this 4th of July, I want you to understand something. The only reason we're a free country is because there's some people who have cared enough about the Word of God to grow in grace and in knowledge enough so as to sustain this country. Pentecostals aren't sustaining this country. They're harming it. And Christ is not impressed, and God the Father is not impressed with all the silly things people do. What, what, what are people thinking? They're not. They're emoting. They get all emotional about something. So again, I could have a large church if I decided to go that route. Do you think I could? I know I could. I could start entertaining right and left. I can really put on a show. I can play my violin, which I can play very well. I can have my wife sing while I play my violin very well. And we can just have a grand old time and people would flood into this church. But that's not what I want. I want people who are serious about what does this say. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we've noted. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.